I am so insanely excited to have Michael Warburton here. You know, Michael, I don't think people realize just how sprawling the assets of San Diego Zoo are. Can you just quickly touch on that? So the Wild Animal Park uh, opened in 1972, um, and it, it did okay for a very, very long time. The, the challenge that happened was we had identity crisis, or, or, or people didn't know the difference between the zoo and the park. You know, I can see wild animals at the zoo, why do I need to go to the park? Uh, and that made it difficult to really position them in the marketplace, position them in the minds of the consumer. And, um, and so over the years, subsequently, products came online at the, at the Wild Animal Park, um, and it became a safari experience. And, and truly, when we renamed to the, to the safari park, most people told us that's what it was. It was like going on safari. Totally made sense, right? No brainer. Um, and most, if not all, of the products when we made that switch were already existing. It's not like we created new product to suit this new brand. We caught up, sort of, the name caught up with what the, the place was. Um, so that was the Safari Park, uh, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Institute, San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research, sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, it used to be CRESS, and it, it, the, the acronym stood for different things over time. Uh, but one of them was Center for Reproduction of Endangered Species. Um, who knew what that was? You know, no one. And, and, and what's funny is when our, our researchers would go to a, an event or a conference and they'd say, I'm from Crest, and people go, where? And they San Diego Zoo. Oh, <laughs> right? So, 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 man, this is just common sense. It sounds like common sense now, but it was a, a massive shift. Mm -hmm. But when we renamed it to San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research, the next day we had immediate pickup on PR stories that we would never get pickup for, uh, a chytrid fungus in a frog, you know? And we got national pickup on that story, just because now it led with the brand with the equity with San Diego Zoo. So San Diego Zoo Safari Park, San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research, and then the, the, the overarching brand, um, and still legally, is Zoological Society of San Diego. And Again, what the heck is that? Mm -hmm. You know, people would go to conferences and again say, oh, San Diego Zoo. Um, so looking at our, our assets, looking at what we do around the world, uh, it made sense to rebrand our overarching brand as San Diego Zoo Global. Uh, and people get it. It basically says that the San Diego Zoo works outside of our own area and cares about places outside of San Diego. Uh, okay, you said the name or earlier. The name caught up with what the brand was doing. With the safari park, yeah. That implies that you know you had some other guiding force that directed you to do what you did, right? And that the name naturally fell into place at a certain point in time. And I just wonder, how do you define that? How do you find it, and how do you live it? That that's a great question. So we uh, several years ago, before we even developed the the new branding, um, we developed brand prints. Uh, which are sort of our, our guide for the zoo. We have one for every brand, right? Like fingerprints? Pretty much, and, and it's a one page, uh, you know, written very fluffy, but uh, very descriptive about what each of these brands are. You know, the, the zoo is urban, uh, downtown, lush green environment. There's certain hero animals for the zoo. The park brand print, completely different. You know, uh, very much like a savanna environment. Uh, earth tone colors, those types of things. So those brand prints actually help us with new product development guidance, right? It's sort of like the, the Lippmann's way of looking at your, your attributes, your core attributes. And everyone in the organization has the ability to read that and understand it and know what that means. So, so from the top to the bottom, you, you know what is it we're good at, what is it we're, we do, and what are we expected to do as a brand, and how should it look and smell and feel? Sometimes literally smell. <laughs> Depends on if you're downwind. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, you mentioned to me that uh, you use the expression, zoos aren't zoos anymore. And what does that mean exactly? Oh boy. So this is a really big And let topic. me explain why I asked the question. Because I, I think as a result of what Chad said and what you're saying, you could argue that radio isn't necessarily radio anymore. It's something larger. Yeah, I, we need to look at this as an industry. First of all, right, and and this will translate to the radio mindset. Um, zoos, 
you know, many, many years ago, 50, 60, even 100 years ago, it was a menagerie of animals. It was a place to go and look at monkeys, right? That was really the purpose. It's like, oh, let's go look at animals. We're expected to have a higher purpose now, we're ex and we deliver and fulfill on a higher purpose. Why? Zoos, well, wait, why? Why? Because from a con conservation aspect, all zoos now work together on, on conservation projects. Um, there's things called an SSP, Species Survival Plan. Our collection is massive. But a lot of it isn't even here in San Diego. We, we loan them to other zoos because the species survival plan it, you know, dictates and helps us work on conservation bigger than our own company, our own brand. It's industry-wide collaboration. Um, but we do it because you know, that's, that's our mission. We want to, as a nonprofit, you know, we want to make the earth a better place and, and save wildlife and save species. Um, we're not, this is a differentiator for us a key differentiator, especially for San Diego Zoo Global as, overall, is we're not necessarily focused on habitat, and we're not necessarily focused on working with governments in other countries uh, for legislation or whatever rules to, to support conservation work. We're focused on bringing species back from the brink of extinction. We can own the fact that we are animal experts we're good at breeding animals. We're good at the technology side and, and the science of saving species. We're good at that. And, and yes, we'll do the other stuff, but we also partner with other organizations that do that stuff better than us. You know, uh, WWF Conservation International, what, US Fish and Wildlife. You know, we have a ton of partners that, uh, that we collaborate with knowing that we're really good at the animal piece, right? Be good, mm -hmm. be good at what you're at, be good at, mm -hmm. focus. Um, you know, people know what the zoo is, what, what San Diego Zoo is. Traditionally, I, yes. Traditionally. And I wonder, for something like that where you say, okay, to the average person, there's giraffes, there's monkeys, how do you, I, and I know what the answer is, but I want to hear you say it, how do you keep something like that fresh? And this is a problem we have in broadcasting, right? It's largely the same music day after day, many of the same features and so on. So our expectation is that people come back again and again, and we grow the number of people, and we grow the time they spend. How do you keep it fresh such that people want to go to the effort of going to the zoo again and again and again when they've been there before? Yeah, so let's separate it out by brand, first okay. of all, because the zoo is a very different product than the safari park. Um, and the safari park traditionally sees less frequent return than the zoo. It's out a little bit farther away. Um, it's more of a trek for the day, you have to go for the day. The zoo, you can go for a couple of hours. Um, but because of that, the zoo, as a relationship, where's that buzzword people are raising their hand about relationship, right? People, people can engage with us on their convenience. So that's really important to us, but it, it, we try to become relevant in people's lives, and that's the fundamental piece, right? If we can stay relevant and, and, and tell stories to them, we're full of stories. We're almost 100 years old. Boy, we got stories like crazy. So, so if we can maintain relevancy with people in their daily lives, wherever they might be, we're, we're top of mind and they, they have an affinity for us and they want to come see us again and again. Um, as far as innovation or doing things like that, we've always done that. Historically, we we're known for that within our own industry, first off. Um, exhibit design is a good example. You know, we're the first people to create um, multi-species exhibits the way we do and, and the way you view exhibits. It just Within our industry, we innovate all the time we've branched out. We've started innovating within human resources, as an example, and doing things within human resources that are a little innovative, and we're now at SHRM conferences talking about things, uh, the human resources conferences. Um, within marketing techniques, you know, we are always uh, looking at what we're doing within the industry compared to the industry, but we don't compete with our own industry in this market. You know, think about it. What other zoo competes with us in this market? We compete with for-profits that have budgets, you know, easily four times or more than what we have to work with. Um, Disney, Lego, SeaWorld, you know, we're in the attractions market. And so that's really who we're competing with for discretionary dollars. So we have to be innovative and creative on a, on a budget. You know, we're a nonprofit. Uh, so, so we're always innovating in that way. Um, it's just always trying to do new things, try new things, stretch as a brand, but stay true to the core. Um, relevance in people's lives is something that you said. How do you, how do you do that? I mean, if I'm not at the zoo, how are you relevant in my life? What are the, what are the ways in which you do that? That cracks me up. So, so somebody, 
I, maybe she changed C. Oh, there you are. So, hi, I'm XYZ Brand, right? You, you sort of likened it to meeting somebody for the first time. Well, one of my exchanges with Mark, I saw that he has giant Newfoundland dogs, right? One of my exchanges was, hey, did you know that the zoo uh, pairs dogs with cheetahs? Like, we've been doing it for years, and the reason is... It's not a mating program. That would be wrong. So, <laughs> no, so, so, you know, and then I explained how the dogs are really the dominant animal, even though the cheetah many times is way bigger, um, and the dog has a mellow nature, and, it, and it, it keeps the cheetah calm, you know? So it really makes the cheetahs um, easy to handle, easy to be around, that type of thing, um, and, and it's a great relationship. So I'm telling a story that is completely relevant to him. Well, we've got almost 100 years worth of stories, and, and we are a conservation organization, and we're also storytellers. We have a, a slew of writers, content writers, that write for lots of different purposes. We have two videographers, we have a photographer, um, an in-house digital team, an in-house traditional design team. So, so we're big on telling stories. We've had a magazine, Zoo News Magazine. We've published that thing since 1926. Wow. You know, we've been doing that for, for a very long time. And, and even that's changing. You know, we, uh, last year we introduced a tablet version of it. And, and we didn't just make it an interactive PDF. Like we went full bore and it's, it has galleries and video content and all kinds of things in there. Um, you know, we, we tell stories online. Our, our website, uh, Quantcast, typically ranks it between 5,000 and 7,000 of all websites. Think about that. You know, we have a lot of visitation on our site, and it's not necessarily because people are coming to visit. It's because they're, they want to learn content, they want to see content. Pandacam, anyone ever heard of it? Of course you have, right? Uh, so, so, so things like that. Um, the video content has been huge for us. It's not, un, it's, it's very typical that we would have 600,000 or more video views on our own site a month. So, so we're putting a lot of content out there um, and telling stories and being relevant to people in, in different ways. Some people are cat people. Some people, uh, you know, like to know what the science is behind, you know, eggs. Mm. But, you know, we've got that content. We, we make the content. We make it relevant for people. Um, and we have to be very smart about it. Often we'll repurpose the content. We shoot all of our own, uh, pretty much the majority of news releases you see on TV, we shoot and edit and package. We keep the content, and then we repurpose that content for web, you know, all these other outlets. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we, we try to be extremely efficient on the content we generate. Um, mm. But the content is what makes it, makes us relevant. You know? Now, uh, you mentioned... Wow, that was a long answer, sorry guys. No, that was a good answer, it was a great <laughs> answer, in fact. You mentioned the galleries, uh, galleries in the, uh, the, I, the, the iPad app, for yeah, example. Yeah, the iPad And for... here's my question. You know, there's a good enough to get by level of performance, and there's a let's also do this level. And again, in a cash-strapped world, um, why bother with the extra effort? Wow, because it, it matters to a lot of people. Because if, if a consumer or a client or anybody sees that you're willing to put all in and make something as great as it can be, um, they're going to appreciate it that much more, you know. We have we have a reputation, and so there's an expectation, you know. Uh, so we need to make sure we're we're delivering on that expectation. As Chad said, the the promise, right? The brand promise. You expect us to be world famous. We didn't give ourselves that name, by the way. There's there's a world famous <laughs> something tattoo shop or on one of these corners. I think they gave themselves that name. <laughs> People decided to call us world famous, and we rarely ever call ourselves world famous. Other people do. Um, we have to live up to expectations, and that's doing things the right way. We're fortunate, very fortunate, in being a brand that's, you know, we're seen as a little bit progressive. Um, we're, we're a great brand to work with. We have brand equity. And so that allows us to have really great top shelf companies work with us um, on the cheap, you know, um, because they know that we're part of their portfolio, but they also know that we're going we're gonna to do it right. You know, we're going we're gonna to go full bore on something if we're going to do it and, and really make it special. You mentioned that uh, World Class wasn't your name for the brand. It was the name that others gave the brand. And I wonder, how does a brand become World Class and how does it stay that way? Wow. So you, got, you have a couple different categories with this one, right? So 
pick most brands that you know is world class, and most of them have been around for a very long time, very long time. Mm -hmm. So they've had decades to develop uh, um, in the mindset of the consumer what their brand promise is and that they can deliver on it. Um, Volvo for safety is an example that came up earlier. Um, when you don't have time, typically, it, so a sector like digital or technology, a lot of those are very quick to grow. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a whole nother thing. My favorite is the, is the ones that are quickly grown. Typically, if they grow quickly and have a lot of equity quickly, they're gonna fall off quickly. And not, not digital, but you know, think of things even like a Snuggie, right? A couple of years ago, everybody knew what a Snuggie was. And now it's like, where's Snuggie? Maybe in the holidays or in the, as seen on TV store. But the point is, it's like big surge in popularity and, and awareness of the brand. You know, they definitely delivered on the brand promise. You put your smock on backwards and stay warm. But, uh, <laughs> but where are they now? You know, so, so if, if you're okay with that, with having a brand that's going to swell quickly and then taper down, uh, you just have to prepare for that. With, but for the most part, history in delivering on a brand promise is what, what makes it. Um, the reason a lot of tech brands have a, a swell in equity quickly is because it's new. It's typically a new thing, but even a lot of tech brands either go away or they get absorbed by a bigger brand or that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot, of, yeah, I mean, what's, what's the next Twitter, you know, or... Tech is a whole another animal. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but you told me you were the first brand manager at the San Diego Zoo. First one. And I, and I, you know, that's amazing for a brand that's been around that long. And my question, I guess, is why do they need a brand manager? Why, why? now? What took uh, so long? Because we don't want to be Kodak. You know, I'm the guy that's not falling asleep at the wheel, basically. Kodak, great brand, nostalgic, you know, very credible uh, in their space. But they fell asleep at the wheel. Other people were developing technology that was similar or overriding. And uh, somebody wasn't saying, hey, we should look at that. You know, we're, we're downtrending a little bit. Or, you know, no, nobody was watching. Um, mm. For me, there's a couple of things. One, I need to make sure that as a brand, we're represented out there um, and, and that people have a warm spot in their heart for us, right? We want to make sure that people understand who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. We're not just a zoo anymore. Um, we've gone through great lengths in the past few years to raise the, the conservation awareness of our organization. Uh, national PSA TV campaigns, things like that. Uh, so, so these are the kinds of things that I have to manage. And these are things that would have been totally torn apart and taken on by this department over here, that department over there. And so it's, it comes down to then brand consistency. Um, in the whole rebranding process, I was the czar, right? We had a process where any use of the new marks all, all came through me. You know, it, it, it was overwhelming, but you know what? It had to be done. And now it's not a problem because we're a couple years into it and people are just reusing the marks in the same way, just changing the, the content uh, of a, like a piece of collateral. You know, kind of looks the same. The use is correct. They're just changing the content. It's an interesting observation that in, in radio specifically, um, there very often isn't anyone in the, brand, in the marketing function. Um, they're in the programming function, the content function, but they're not in the brand slash marketing function. Oh, this is going to be an interesting topic. So, because I'm going to just run with this. You know, Go ahead. Uh, you know, radio is pretty cool. I love radio. Uh, I'm of that 40 something age. You know, loved it in the 80s when it peaked. Woo. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Radio isn't, um, it's not inventing itself. Wait, let me, I just rewound myself. So, 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 <laughs> Chad kind of touched on something and, and actually with the gentleman out front, I was talking about it too. Radio means broadcast audio content in the mind of a gazillion million people out there. So when somebody called it iHeartRadio, they're talking to us people who are 30s, 40s, grew up with radio. Oh, I know what that is because radio's on the end. You know, I, I think the word radio 
has, has it means something very specific, and we're trying to attribute it to something that's not broadcast audio content or music. So, so I think, as a name, to his point, you know, it could have been iHeart toothpaste, whatever. You know, you could name it something else as long as you're doing due diligence and delivering information about what what that thing is. Um, radio is a term that in many of our minds talks about broadcast. So let me stay there. So broadcast, opportunity for growth. Sure, I'm a big content guy. We, we're in the business of content other than conservation. Um, nothing thrills me. Here's a story. Here's a little story. I used to love the fact that Channel 6 at the time used to broadcast on 88 something the television programs because I would drive in my car and listen to The Simpsons. And theater of the mind was hilarious. I would build these episodes in my brain and, you know, throw, you know. I, I would see these characters and, and I loved that. Um, isn't that what you, radio used to be before TV screwed it all up? You know, you went to radio to hear your news, be entertained with original programming, original content, you know, War of the Worlds, you know. It was really just an all encompassing medium. And then ra TV came along and now we're just playing music right, back then. Um, yeah, there's still other programming out there, but again, focusing only on broadcast because digital and podcasts and all that other stuff is a whole other thing. Um, you know who your audience is. This is, and I think I sent you an email about this. You know, you're, you tell me who your audience is all the time when I want to buy media. Oh, the medium household income and you know, their age and they skew this way. Well, you know who they are, so make content for them. Why not? And don't be afraid to take a little bit of a risk. We, we, we are on a shoestring nonprofit budget, but I always carve a little bit out for testing new things with media buying and things like that. So anyway, so content to me is, is a great opportunity for radio. Um, and also maybe not putting it on air. Maybe you do a teaser on the radio, but take them back to your site for video content, you know, or, you know, there's this, there's ways to make that broadcast piece relevant again. Um, as far as the, the online piece of it, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, it's going to be pervasive. Um, it's convenient for a lot of people. Uh, inter satellite. My car came with a, a subscription to one of the satellite things for a year. It's like I turned it on twice. You know, I'd rather beep around between you know rock, pop talk when I'm, mm -hmm. when I'm cruising around, you know. Um, people want to consume what they want to consume. So you're going to go, what does that mean? Say it. I wasn't going to say that. Oh. <laughs> I know what that means. So this came up with another person out here in the audience. Um, um, and we've talked about this loosely. Uh, I gave him an example. I, I, I tend to meet with a lot of the partners that we buy media from and be proactive in saying, this is what we've got going this year. These are our goals. What can you do to help us meet the goals? It's not them calling me up and say, hey, we can give you this, we can give you that. You know? So it becomes more you fitting into my strategy. Uh, I have an example, I won't name a station, but they called me up, you've bought our station for 16 years. You know, why aren't you buying it this year? And it's like, because it doesn't fit the strategy, you know? It, it all has to In be... In other words, it's all about me, it's not about you, why aren't you buying me again? Right, it's gotta be strategic. And, and, and for that particular campaign, what they had to offer and who they were speaking to as a station uh, wasn't necessarily relevant to our campaign. Uh, related to that, one of the things you said to me when we talked about this was, you would go and say, here's all the stuff we're involved in, now come back to us with you know, a, a, a menu of things which can fit into that strategy using your medium. Oh, yeah. And, and that that's often not what you get from, broadcast, from radio broadcasts. What you get from radio broadcasts is, here are our numbers, please buy us again. Well, yeah, it's the same message every year that we get, or the same pitch, really, every year. Um, with the exception that, you know, over the past few years, you can put banners on our website. You know, or, or <laughs> you know, there's some, like, a little bit of stretch as far as offerings. Um, but it's, but it's, you know, come on, you know, there, you could be producing content that we could 
sponsor or you know things like that. It would have to be brand fit, and it would have to be you know there's a lot of parameters strategically that we would look at. Um, but there are things that you could do. I mean, I'm representative of one brand of all the brands that could be buying your stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one more question, then we'll go to the audience. Um, between social media and a zillion other ways to spend resources and reaching people through digital and other means, I mean, how do you decide how to spend your precious time and resources? Here's one illustration of my question. I follow San Diego Zoo on Vine. There's probably, I don't remember exactly, a few thousand people that follow on Vine. Any diff given post gets, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 comments. Is that good? Is that, you know, you, do you know what I'm trying to say? Is, is that unit of time well spent? How do you know? I, I know what you're trying to say. So we have a social media guy dedicated to social. Love it. He's expanded our reach within social. And he's always poking at stuff. You know, we'll see how Vine develops. We'll see how even Pinterest or others develop over the course of time. And maybe we'll stop. Uh, that actually came into my head and I forgot it while Chad was talking. But, you know, a lot of companies are really good at doing all kinds of new stuff. Have you ever stopped it and looked at the old stuff to decide if you should keep doing it? You know, And suddenly now, oh, I need more money to do this new thing. Well, stop doing that thing, you'll have all the money you need. Mm -hmm. you know? So with social media, he's got a finite amount of time, right? And so he's going to put us in as many spaces as he's, he feels that are relevant, that he can maintain and maintain well and then he monitors it. And so, you know, this really isn't worth a whole lot of time. Um, hey, MySpace, sound familiar? Yeah, well, we're not big in MySpace right now. So but even though there metric? might be a resurgence because Justin Timberlake, but that's a whole nother. But, but what's your metric for something like that, Mike? I mean, how do you set a threshold for the definition of success or failure there? With social in particular, um, it's the amount of engagement or the the like with, with the one you, with Vine, or, or actually let's talk about uh, Instagram, right? That's a huge one for us. Um, do we make money off of Instagram? Does anybody make money off of social, first of all? Not really. Um, but what does it do? It helps us tell the story through somebody else's eyes. That's a huge thing. So if there becomes a little bit more critical mass for Vine or for some other outlet, great. Um, but the thing is, having people tell this, our story in their own words is super important. Um, and the only way they're going to do that is if we're in a relationship with them, you know, and they know what we're about as a brand. We're consistently delivering on a brand promise, and they're excited about what we do. You know, Koalifornia, right now, it's our new campaign supporting the Australian Outback exhibit. Uh, that was Koalifornia. Koalifornia. Uh, people are loving it, eating it up. Hashtag Koalifornia. There's so much chatter, it's ridiculous. And people <laughs> taking pictures of themselves in the t-shirts everywhere and stuff like that. It's the excitement and the buzz that, you know, they'll, I feel like an Herbal Essence commercial, you know? They'll tell two friends, and so on, and so on. <laughs> now I'm dating myself. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, so, and we also have ROI and ROM, so return on investment, but we have return on mission, right? We're nonprofit. That doesn't mean no profit, by the way. Uh, because we have to fund the work that we do, the conservation work. Uh, but, but return on mission is just as important to us in many, many, many cases as the return on the investment. Um, we have initiatives that have nothing to do with making money, obviously. Saving animals doesn't really pay well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it pays in the big picture of you know, life and the world. So uh, that's pretty cool. And, uh, and other things, education. There's three pillars to our, to our um, mission, and they're conservation, education, and recreation. So it's basically saving, saving species, you know, teaching people about the world and about nature, and making sure people have a good time. You know? And we, through our creative in particular, we try to make sure people are having fun with it. Uh, if you haven't, we're not airing the TV commercials in this market because it wasn't strategic. But they are on our YouTube page. Uh, the new TV spots are hilarious, you know, and, and that's something we pride ourselves on is being very uh, lighthearted and telling a great story. Anybody in our space can show smiling kids at an exhibit and then show the end card. Boring, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you expect more. You expect a story, and we like to tell stories. So, Mike Warburton is the fabulous brand manager of San Diego Global, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank